in this live stream, we're going to be focused on the fundamentals of American Mahjong using the National Mahjong League card. If you're new to Mahjong, or if you already know how to play, and just want to build your skills, consider subscribing to my channel. That way you won't miss anything. In this particular live stream, we're going to hopefully have some opportunities to talk about fundamentals and maybe some strategy at the beginner and intermediate level. Put your questions in caps in the chat. That way moderators can find them. I want to give a quick shout out to moderators to say thank you for helping me with live streams. Welcome to the live stream. How's everybody doing tonight? Can everybody hear me? Looks like we're live. All good? Okay, good. All right. If you are new to the game, type in chat, hashtag new. Hi, Karen. So this is the first beginner forum. The idea is to have an opportunity for beginners and inter intermediate players to ask any question. Any questions are welcome. No judgment. So don't be afraid to post your comments and questions. I am logged in to Mahjong time in Mahjong school. So if you want to see anything demonstrated, let me know. And we can play with a robot and try to demonstrate answers to questions that you might have. It could be about the game itself or it could be strategy, decision making, whatever causes you any kind of pain points. Hi, Carol. Do we have any beginners in, in the room tonight? This live stream is for you. Well, anybody is welcome. Anybody can learn something, no matter what skill level you are. But this particular live stream is focused on fundamentals. And if this is a format that is helpful for people, we'll do it on the first Monday of the month for now. Uh, let's see. Lena is asking, do you have a recommended app to play Mahjong to sharpen your skills? There are several platforms available and it's interesting because people have favorites and it's typically the first platform that you play on because it becomes familiar to you. So making a change after you've become familiar with a platform, you're gonna be on a learning curve. Regardless of where you play, you're gonna be on a learning curve. My preferred place to play is Mahjong Time, which is what you see on the screen right now. This is a more robust platform than most. There are several reasons why I personally like to play here. The first reason is because they have five versions of the game, and I like to play all types of Mahjong. American Mahjong, which is what we're focused on tonight, is one of the five versions. The other reasons why I like to play here is because of the community and the owner of Mahjong Time, Slava Novogenia. He's open to player input, and so the platform can be developed to be more like the actual game. 
He tries to develop the game so that it is as close to the in-person game as possible. And that's another reason why I like it, because of the interface. It feels like you're playing at a table. There are other platforms that try to emulate that look and feel, but I don't think that they come close to the interface at Mahjong time. The other reason why I like playing here is because of the community of players. It's a very healthy, happy community. And you can play in guilds, so there's a competition between guilds on a weekly basis, and you can win in-game currency if you win as a guild. And even within the guild, the winnings are dispersed based on placement within the guild. So there's a good healthy competition there. And there are also marathons by season and tournaments. Mahjong Time right now is the only place that offers those features. Guild play, competitions, marathons, and tournaments. So that's why I like to play at Mahjong Time. Let's see, Karen says, I'm more intermediate, but my issues are usually around decisions in the Charleston, finding the strength in my dealt hand, which is kind of all over the place. Watched and love this morning's video. Excellent, very good. Well, we could maybe do some random pulls at Mahjong time. When you play against robots, you don't have to finish the game. You can get your dealt hand, exit the game, get another dealt hand, and just repeat, repeat, repeat. To practice identifying the strength in adult hand. So we can demonstrate that if you want. Okay, Karen Finkel says, I'm still a beginner. Question, if I'm going for a pung in the third hand under like numbers and I have no numbers, can I use three jokers? Yes, you can. However, that is a gap. You have, you'd be In that instance, you'd be playing a gap hand. You have to define one of the jokers in your hand so that the game knows what hand you're going for. Otherwise, it won't know what, game, what hand you're playing. It only knows based on the known tiles, and jokers are wild. So with the way that the program is built right now, you have to define a joker, and we can demonstrate that. So we'll demonstrate random pulls, and we'll demonstrate defining a joker. So far, those are the two things on the agenda. Okay, so let's go ahead and, oh, you're welcome. Let's go ahead and see if we can, I'll show you how to define a joker. We'll just do that right now. So we're going to, we're, we're in school, Mahjong school right now, and you can see there are gold people. Those are people sitting at a table playing the game. If you see three people and then a gray one, that means that's an open seat. So we're going to find a free practice table so that the tiles are dealt randomly. Any game, incidentally, that has the name of a category on the card, you're going to be set up for that category with those dealt tiles. For example, if you play 2468, you're going to be dealt 2468 so that you can learn and be set up for success for that particular category as you get used to the platform. In this case, we're going to join a free practice table and we'll try to define a joker. Let's hope that we get a joker. If we don't, we'll just exit and we'll do it again until we get a joker. So right now we're playing with robots. Uh, hi, San Vino. Okay, let me turn that down. Okay, we do have a joker. We have two jokers. All right, now when you play in Mahjong School, you have all the time you need to make decisions. And incidentally, you cannot define a joker during the Charleston. So we're going to have to go through the Charleston. And then once we get to our uh, the pick and discard phase of the game, we'll be able to define a joker. So let me just look at the Sambino's comment here. If you have a pair of a tile that a person needs, would you be able to call them dead? 
if the other two tiles are already discarded or would you have to discard one before you declare? All right, so let's break that up into two after we do this um, particular demonstration. So I'm gonna start a list of what we're gonna cover so that I don't forget. So we're going to demonstrate random pulls. We're gonna demonstrate defining a joker. And then we're gonna de we're gonna talk about um, declaring a player's oops hand dead, considering or with the tiles in your hand. And or exposed. And then the second part of that question was, can you declare their hand dead after you discard one of those tiles? Because that's kind of a loaded question right now. So we'll cover that momentarily. Okay, so let me just see here. Uh, Marsha, is this not the regular Monday live stream? That's correct. This is a new normal, I'm hoping. This is going to be a live stream focused on fundamentals for beginners and intermediate players. So we're going to answer questions and do demonstrations in Mahjong school. Uh, maybe live play if that's requested. So this is not the, the Let's Play live stream that used to be on Monday nights. The Let's Play live streams are now going to be on Fridays, starting at 5.30 with Siamese Mahjong for an hour, and then we'll go two hours after that with the four-player game. So Friday night is the normal Let's Play live stream. This is for beginners. Okay, let's see. All right. So let's go on with the Charleston. So because I have a multiple with a five, I think maybe five, seven, nine big odds or consecutive run. So I think we'll let the west, the green, and this eight dot go. Well, actually, maybe we'll keep the green dragon and let the three go because if I can, oh, we already have two. Let's see, let's, let's do eight and three. I want to keep that green dragon because there is a consecutive run hand that uses opposite dragons. Second hand from the bottom under consecutive run. So we're going to try to blaze through this, uh, this Charleston so that we can get to how to define a joker. So we have one, three, five, seven, nine. We have three, four, five, one, three, five. So let's let at this point, let's let the green dragon go because we do have no gaps with one, three, five, seven, nine, and one suit, the very first hand. <laughs> well, I do have videos in both fundamentals and strategy, strategy on my YouTube channel. Okay, we did pick up a five, so there's a big multiple in there, pung of fives. So we at this point have to make a choice because we have a pair of twos. Even though that is a multiple, the strength of our hand is going to be the predominant pattern of odds. One, two, or one, three, five, seven, nine, I think. So I would probably let the little number go, the four crack. Let's see. Uh, also, if you are a beginner, don't be afraid to ask Michelle questions. Yes, please. Oh, thank you, Sambino. Thank you so much, Pamela. All right. Oh, look, we ended up with a pair of sixes. Okay, so now this is where I would reassess because we have five, six now. Five, six consecutive multiples. So you might think, well, why not just discard two, three, six? This would be a very risky discard. Two, three, six, and one suit. I think what I might do is focus on five, six, seven, or five through eight, and break up this one suit so as to pass defensively. So maybe pass three, two, six. 
that's a little more defensive than passing two, three, six in one suit. You want to build your hand, but you also want to pass defensively because you could be building your opponent's hands. So now we've got five discards here to pick from. We might get the three crack back, so let's hold the one. So let's pass two, three, six. That's a little better than passing the two, three dot, two, three bam, at least it's two different suits. So let's see if we can build up five, six, seven. We got a four, which is interesting. So we have four, five, six, seven now. There is a hand under consecutive run, fifth hand, sixth hand down that we might be able to play. Let's discard two, nine, three. Oh, thank you, Karen. Yes, I do not judge. If you're playing at my table, I won't judge your, what you're passing. I'll, I play my hand and I, I don't judge, but I do use learning opportunities. I leverage the opportunities to learn. So I do gameplay with commentary and I talk about different passes, but not to judge, but just to learn. So here we have four, five, six, seven, nine. Because we have no three crack, I would not play the odd hand. I would leverage consecutive tiles. And instead of passing like numbers with ones, these two here, I would pass one of each suit and let the nine go, the nine crack here. So we're going to pass three and let the nine crack go. All right, there's our nine crack going away. Okay, so now we're at the discard, pick and discard phase of the game. This is when you can define a joker. So let's say that we wanted to play the hand with flowers, and this would be the sixth, fifth hand down. One, two, three, one, two, three, six hand down. Kong of flowers, single pair Pung Kong. Right now we don't have a three. We don't have flowers, of course, so we need flowers, we need a three, and then we can do single pair, let's see, we could do single pair, Pung Kong, and then maybe use the jokers for flowers. So these would go away right here from the four dot over would go away. So we have a gap, we have no flowers. So to define that, to fill the gap, so the game know what, hands you're, what hand you're playing, you double click on it, and then you click Define Joker. And then you'll get a dialog box with a palette of one of each tile that, that you can play with. So here we're going to define any flower. So we're going to click on a flower, and it will define one of your, jo your jokers. So now we have no gaps. And if a flower is discarded, we'll be prompted because we have a flower in our hand now that we defined that joker. And we could play single pair Pung Kong with four, five, six, seven, and four flowers. That's how you define a joker. Now, let's say that instead of flowers, the sixth hand down, let's say we're going to maybe play the fourth hand down with dragons and we have a gap there too we have no red dragons but we could play four five six four five six dragon so to undefine you double click on the tile that was defined you click undefined joker and now it's a joker again and now we can define it instead as a red dragon now we don't have a gap for four five six four five six Pung Kong, Pung Kong, and then we can discard these tiles here. So that's how you define a joker. Define and undefine. And that's only required if you're playing a hand with a gap. If you have a tile for that missing tile in your hand, if you, if you don't have a missing tile, you're not playing a gap hand. Let's say we have one red dragon. You have no gaps then, so you don't have to define a joker. Defining a joker is only if you have a gap for the actual natural tile. I hope that helps. 
Okay, so yeah, the the Siamese Mahjong game, you're, you can't define a joker, but they've built it into the programming so the game knows, uh, has a greater ability to identify what hand you're playing. And what I've heard is that that's going to be programmed in this particular platform as well, but just later. Right now, this is the uh, an older version of the code, so the ability to for the game to know what hand you're playing if you have a gap hand that hasn't been built in yet so we have to define a joker in order to fill a gap okay all right so now i'm going to exit we're not going to play this out i want to we'll, what we're going to do next so we did we defined a joker that was the first thing that we did the next thing we're going to do is let, let me answer the question uh, from Sambino on declaring a player's hand dead. And this applies to live in-person games and online. When you have, when you know what a person needs to win their hand, and let's say that is either a single or a pair tile and there are two tiles that you know they need on the table so they've been previously discarded and let's say that you have the other two in your hand and you know they need a single let's say for example they're playing the odd concealed hand two flowers one three five single pair pung Five seven nine single pair pung, and let's say that you ha you see that there are two one cracks out, and actually that's not a good example because that's a concealed hand. You wouldn't want, you wouldn't know what hand they're playing. We need to pick something where we know what they're playing. So let's use a different example. That was not a good example. I'm trying to see. Okay, let's say. Okay, let's say that somebody is playing like numbers number three, where they need five flowers, a pair of ones, three ones, and then four ones, like numbers with ones. And let's say there are two one cracks out, and you have the other ones, two one cracks in your hand, and let's say they have a pung of one dots and a kong of one bams out you know that they need one cracks but there are two out and you have two in your hand you cannot declare their hand dead because of the two in your hand the the requirement is that the tiles have to be visible so if there are two out in a discard, then you can't declare their hand dead if you have the other two in your hand because they're not visible to anybody else. Now let's say you have one in your hand and there are two on the table. You still can't declare their hand dead because you have one in your hand and there's still one more out. So let's say you discard that one crack and then another player declares a pung with two jokers and they put up two jokers and a one then there's only one more left and if they're playing that like number hand they can't complete that hand they've committed with two other exposures with ones there's only one hand they could be playing at that point if you're in a live game any player can declare their hand dead at that point once that exposure is up. Online, you have to wait your turn. So let's say I'm the player who discarded the one crack. So my turn is now over. The player to my left claims that one crack for a pung. 
and that means that the player with like numbers is dead, it's not my turn, so I cannot declare their hand dead. But let's say that that player to my left who claimed the one for a pung, if they noticed that what hand that other player was playing, they can declare that hand dead. If they didn't notice, it would then be my turn, and I would draw from the wall, declare their hand dead, and then they would stop playing. So I hope that helps, Sambino. Let me know if you have any further questions about declaring a player's hand dead. You have to be able to identify the tiles out on the table. They have to be visible. You do not consider the tiles in your hand. Hi, Jingles. All right, so let me just back up here and see if I've uh, missed anything. Did I answer your question okay, um, Sambino? Let's see. Oh, Karen Finkel, thank you so much for saying that. It's very kind. I appreciate that support. <laughs> okay, let's see here. So, Sambino, let me know if that explanation helped about, de about declaring a player's hand dead. You have to be able to see their tiles. Okay, Sharon is asking, can you explain the benefits of declaring someone's hand dead? That's an, a very timely question. Okay, so, and Vicki will talk about this as well. So... Now, there are a couple of variables that you have to consider. If you're playing a game, whether in person or online, and you know that a player's hand is not viable, they're not going to be able to complete their hand, whether it's because of the tiles that are visible on the table or the tiles in your hand, if they have jokers visible in their exposures, you might delay declaring their hand dead because once you declare a player's hand dead, any exposure that they make there, thereafter, or let's say that they have, let's say they have um, one exposure. Okay, this might be a, an exploit, okay? So let's say that a player has two exposures. The second exposure is invalid. And let's say the, the, both of those exposures have jokers in them. And you know that they can't make their hand because it's an invalid exposure. The, the, the block of tiles that made the hand invalid, the joker in that exposure is not redeemable if the hand is declared dead. Any exposure with a joker prior to the invalid exposure, that joker is available for exchange. But a tile in an exposure that is that invalidates the hand, that joker is not redeemable. When a player has made an exposure with a joker, that joker is redeemable with the natural tile. If a player makes an invalid exposure with a joker and another player declares their hand dead, that joker is not redeemable. If players at the table are not aware that the exposure with a joker is invalid, the joker could be exchanged. Later, a player may realize that the hand is invalid and declare that player's hand dead. The player who redeemed the joker did so ethically because the hand was not declared dead at the time. However, if a player is aware that the exposure with the joker is invalid and they want to be able to redeem the joker, they could delay declaring that player's hand dead until after the exchange has been made. Later, they could declare that player's hand dead because of that exposure. This could be considered an exploit. So, I think 
Another reason to delay declaring a player's hand dead is if you're in the early game and they have maybe only no exposures or one exposure, you're not, if you declare their hand invalid, with one exposure you probably can't. With two exposures you might be able to identify their hand. So let's say they have two exposures. If you declare their hand dead, you are not going to have access to the rest of their tiles in their hand. So you need to consider that. Because they're going to stop picking and discarding and those tiles in their hand are locked in. If you wait, you might be able to figure out what tiles they're holding and decide whether or not that will impact your hand. So that's one thing that you can think about. Tor in the end game, if you're in the end game and you know based on the exposures and discards that are out that they probably are not holding your tiles, then I would declare their hand dead because I know they probably are not holding my tiles. If I'm playing evens and they have odds, for example, they are not, they're going to be discarding evens, so I know they're not going to hold evens in the end game, probably, unless they switch to defense. Uh, if I'm playing little consecutive numbers and they have big consecutive numbers, same thing would apply there. So you have to think about the fact that any remaining tiles in their hand are not going to be available to you or anybody else at the table which is another reason why you might declare their hand dead because nobody else at the table can have access to those tiles either. So it's um, complicated, but the thing is if you are correct when you declare their hand dead, you get points for that. You will get the lowest value on the card for that hand. So uh, if you are correct, now if you are incorrect, you owe that player 50 points or 50 cents if you're in a live game, in-person game. If you're playing online at Mahjong time, it's 25 points. All right, so I think we have that question handled. Vicky asked if the player doesn't have the opportunity to change their hand rather than being declared called dead. This is where you have to be very careful when you declare someone's hand dead because if they are able to switch based on their exposures, there's still another opportunity for a different kind of a hand, then you're going to be incorrect and you're going to owe them at the end of the game if they're able to switch their hand. But if you can prove it, then at the end of the game, you, you can justify your declaration and prove your case and then they would owe you those points sometimes you might be wrong especially in a, with a new card because you don't know the hands very well uh, at, at the beginning of the year so you could be wrong and they might be able to switch to something else so an example of that might be the third hand down under consecutive run pung pung kong kong let's say they have a pung of one, well, that's not a good example, actually, because you can't declare that hand dead because it's pung, 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 pung. They can use any number of jokers there. So let's see if we can find an example. Uh, let's see if I can find an example of what someone could be doing. Okay, here's an example. The one, two, three, the six hand down under two, four, six, eight. Pair pung in one suit, two, four. Pair pung in a second suit, four, six, and then a kong of eights. Two, four, six, eight, pair pung, pair pung. Let's say they have a pung of fours in bams, and then they have a pung of sixes in cracks. And you think, oh, all the twos are out. They can't. They they won't be able to play that two four six eight hand. But they could be playing. Wait a minute. That's the wrong one. Hold on. I picked another bad example. <laughs> I was thinking of the second hand down under consecutive run because they could do. Oh, I know. Uh, no, no, that wouldn't work either. 
because it's two suits. I was thinking of the dragon hand, but that dragon hand is one suit. I don't know if there are any examples of a switchable. I really haven't, cons let's see here, if I can find one that would be switchable. Let's see, three, six, I don't, let's see, five, six, seven, five, seven. Okay, here's one, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, so let's say that someone has a Kong of five in BAMs out and a Kong of sevens out. And you're thinking that they're playing the second hand down under odds. They need a Kong of flowers and they need a three and a five. But let's say, uh, and that would be in BAMs, or I'm sorry, in dots. So they have a Kong of five BAMs, a Kong of seven cracks. So you're thinking they need a three, five, in dots and somebody just put out a pung of threes in dots so you're thinking oh they're not going to be able to play that hand I'm going to declare their hand dead because they don't have access to a three dot and they need it for that second hand down the thing is they could be playing the second hand down under consecutive run five six seven where they need a kong of flowers and a pair of six dots in that particular case a Kong of fives and a Kong of sevens in two different suits, and then a pair in the middle in the third suit. So there's an example of that particular situation. So you have to look at any other potential switchable hand and make sure that they don't have that flexibility. Then you can go ahead and declare their hand invalid at that point. All right, let's see. Okay, so let's see. Okay, we're back to, let's see here. Okay, Sambina says, yes, it helped. Um, let's see here. Uh, Lena, Lena is asking, can you declare your own hand dead? No. Now, the... The verbiage in Mahjong made easy is not very clear because they use the word should as if it's an option. Okay, so they say you a player should not declare their hand their own hand dead. They should switch to defense and stay quiet until another player notices and declares that hand dead. So when and by the way, I really hate saying that term. I really it just makes me cringe inside so I like I prefer to use the word invalid so another bulletin came out that said a player should not and cannot declare their own hand invalid and the reason for that is because let's say that they have hot tiles and they don't want to discard it because they could give somebody mahjong if they're able to declare their own hand invalid then they're going to sit on those hot tiles and that's not the way the game is played you cannot declare your own hand invalid that is the responsibility of the other players at the table all right no you don't want to do that all right let's see question uh, morty uh let's see morty's asking question about the number of tiles that define beginning middle and end games oh okay just you have to visualize a full wall 19 stacks you've got a because we roll the dice and break the wall you have to be able to visualize 19 stacks so let me go in and we'll play a game and i'll show you what i mean we're just going to go to another free practice table and i'll demonstrate this uh, let's see, Pamela says she thinks it's 99, 66, or 99 is the start, 66 is mid, and 33 is the end game. So let's, let's prove that theory. And that makes sense because if it's 3, 6, 9, and we have these tiles in our hand, and there's, is there 152 tiles? Yeah, because we're in the begin game, and it's 99 at the moment. So uh, let's see here. 
So here you can see we have a short wall right there. We have uh, one, two, three, four, or one, two. We have two rounds of pick and discard and three remaining. So you, you have to look at really the end wall. So this wall over here to the right, um, south, they have a short wall. So basically you have to do kind of um, a, um, you have to do a reverse view of the wall. So you see all this empty space? Usually what I do is I visualize it over here or visualize the tiles remaining and take it off the front of the preceding wall. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six tiles, six stacks. So I would take six stacks off the third wall. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Therefore, the end game is going to be right about where this middle tile is, it's gonna be right about there. So you look at the end wall and you just subtract it from the full wall that precedes it to try to gauge where that end game is. And that's how I do it visually. I don't focus on the numbers so much. I look at visually the tiles remaining in east wall and then I subtract that off of the preceding wall. I hope that helps. I know that might sound confusing. Um, so basically right where this middle tile is in this cross pass, that right there is about where the begin game is, or the end game, I mean. This is the end game right there. So we're gonna go through all these tiles for the middle game, and then this is the begin game right here. This would be the full wall. You just kind of visualize it so I hope that helps. Um, okay. All right. So I think we're caught up on all the questions so far. Does anybody have any questions or does anybody want to see anything demonstrated? My plan was to do one hour live streams for this format. So we have about 20 minutes to go over any questions or any demonstration that you might want to do uh, that can help beginner or intermediate players. Oh, random polls. Thank you, Karen. Okay, so we're gonna exit Oh, we don't really have to actually, we're at a game right now. So let's just use this as our example. So here's our dealt hand, also called the onset. This is the, be the beginning of the game uh, before the Charleston begins. And when you get your dealt hand, you're going to assess it for, and you're going to look for the strength of the hand. For American Mahjong, because the game is divided in categories and American Mahjong is a game of multiples, the, I have found that the best way to play this game is to build around multiples. So in this random pull or onset or dealt hand, I would start with the one dot. That's where I would build around this for this hand. I would start with one dots. All these tiles here, then I have to assess and decide what can support the multiple and, and use as many tiles as possible and pick the category that uses the most of my tiles. So in this case, we have ones and the remaining tiles, we have twos, uh, fours, a five, we do have a seven, so there's either consecutive run one through five or odds. So I would peel off anything that doesn't fit either odds or consecutive run using one through five. So that means I can discard the eight, the west can go, and we could play four, five, six, seven, four, five, six, seven. So this seven might be a good tile Oh, no, no, 
we're, we're looking at the one. So we could let that seven go if, if we're not playing one, three, five, seven, nine. But I wouldn't play one, three, five, seven, nine in dots here because we have no three, five, nine in dots. We have no three dot and we have no seven crack or nine ban. And that would be for options for the very first odd hand. So I would pass those three for this first random pull. I would build around the ones. Probably I would play one, two, one, two, three, four, probably one, one through five, maybe, if we fill in one, two, three. So the random pull stops when you identify your discards. So here we're gonna build around the one and we have options and we've identified our discards. So then you exit the game and then you do it again. So we're gonna do another Mahjong school. We'll do another practice table. We'll get another dealt hand, random tiles. So they're gonna, the game will give you some random tiles and we'll sort. And we're gonna look for the strength of the hand. So here we have two, four, six, seven, and bams, all singles. We have one, two, five, six, pair of fives. We have two, five, six, nine in dots, singles, and a single north. So for the beginners and the intermediate players in the room, what would you say is the strength of the hand? And what would you focus on? What category would you play? And we'll just stop there. So what is the, what is the strength of this hand? Okay, oh, sorry, Evelyn, I missed your question about the even tiles. Because the one dots are not even, I wouldn't even consider it. I would build around the multiple, the one. Even though those single tiles, there are seven single tiles, you'd have to break up a pair. And American Mahjong is a game of multiples. So if you leverage multiples, you're going to have a much stronger start as you gather supporting tiles for the multiple because this is a game of multiples it's not there there are there's only one category on the card that uses singles and pairs so if you build around multiples pair pong kong even quint if you can then you're going to set yourself up for success by starting at that point okay uh so i hope that helps and we'll see if we can find another example of that, Evelyn, and, and I'll, I'll prove the point. Um, this is why I like to do um, chain reaction, because what you could do with your tiles at home is you can set up the tiles to replicate that hand and then play where you build around the multiples and see how the Charleston ends, and then you can do it all over again because you've taken pictures along the way, and then you could go for two, four, six, eight and get rid of the one and compare the results and see which one is better. More times than not, building around multiples has a better result. Um, okay, so the first question was, what is the strength of the hand and what category would you play? So I see consecutive run, five pair, consecutive run, um, Okay, now we don't want to pick a hand. You don't have to pick a hand if you have discards, so you don't have to go to that level. We're going to stay at the category level. So all we really care about is what is the strength of the hand and what category best uses that strength with the supporting tiles. You don't have to pick a hand because your hand is going to change exponentially during the Charleston. If you pick a hand, you're probably going to have to re-pick again and again and again where you really don't have to do that. You gather. When you run out of discards, that's when you pick a hand. So we don't need to look at which hand to play. We're just going to look at the multiple and then what category to play and focus there. So I see four, five, six, seven 
Morty, uh, Morty Pickles or Karen has picked out a range, and that's very good. If you're playing consecutive run, if you pick four or five numbers around the multiple, that's a very good guideline, so I agree. It looks like everyone picked the strength of the hand here. Um, the five is the strength of the hand, and it looks like most people picked consecutive run, five, six. So I would concur with that. I would keep four, five, six, seven. So I would discard the twos. And I would keep every four, five, six, seven. Because we do have some odd potential with big odds, five, seven, nine, I probably would keep that nine dot. Because we do have tiles we can pass. It is a little bit risky with a one, two. But here we have four, five, six, seven, or five, seven, nine. The stronger potential is with consecutive run. And because we have only one multiple and mixed suits, there's not a clear hand here. You don't have to pick a hand, and I wouldn't pick a hand. We have way too many discards. I would go through the Charleston, and when I run out of discards, that's when I would pick a hand. All right, so five, six, five, six, seven. Yep, that would work, um, but I would not pick a hand, even though that would be uh, a, a good potential hand. I would not pick a hand at this stage. I would gather. And then as the game progresses, I would go with wherever the multiples build. Because what happens if your multiple, let's say that we start getting four bams and six dots. Well, we're no longer going to play five, six, five, six, seven. We're going to play four, five, six, seven, third hand down. So the idea is to stay at the category level and don't be tempted to pick a hand until you run out of discards. So that is random pulls. Now, because this is an interesting idea of picking a hand versus seeing where the hand builds, let's go ahead and go through the Charleston. And we'll see, will the littler numbers come in or will the bigger numbers come in? Do we pick a hand and focus on that hand or play at the category level? Now, we can't do a chain reaction here because the game is going to control that. Um, but we can make, see what we get. Let's at least see what we get in this first pass. Okay, so here we have a 6 and a 2, 3. So... Since we have a multiple now with a six bam, I would reassess completely. Anytime you get a new multiple, reassess your hand. So what I think that we could let go is probably the nine at this point because now we have five, six. So, and those are consecutive multiples. So I wouldn't play an odd hand. I would leverage the multiples. So I would let the nine go and you can't go from one to six. So we're going to let the one go. And you can't go from two to six um, and use the five crack with the two crack. You can't use both the five crack and the six bam with the two crack. So we'll let that go. So now we're building around five and six. And we're still not going to pick a hand. We don't have to pick a hand because we, we have discards. So uh, let's see what we get here. Okay, now we have five, seven, nine. So now here's five, seven, nine, five, six. So we picked up another multiple. We have six, seven now, multiples. So here we have five, six in cracks, six, seven in bams. So we have five, six, seven, and a nine. We have these fives to consider though. It'd be nice if we can leverage the five. What I might consider is playing four, five, six, seven, but we have a gap. We have no four crack. This would be the third hand down. So at this point, I would build around the multiples. Five crack, six bam, seven bam. And I would probably keep the five for five, six, seven. Probably I would let the nine bam go. And then I would let these little numbers go. Two and probably three. We could still play five, six, five, six, five, six, seven. Okay, right here, this is the hand that was recommended, I believe, by Karen. Five, six, five, six, seven. 
three pair or three suits, it would be pung, pung, and cracks, five, six, pung, pung, and dots, five, six, and a pair of sevens. So between five, four, five, six, seven, and two suits, the second or third hand down, we really don't need this four. So instead of passing two, three, which is risky, I would maybe pass nine, two, and four. And that way we're, we're minimizing the risk. So let's see where this hand goes. We're in between, but we're in consecutive run. Okay, now we're building with sixes. Because the sixes came in, I would probably focus on five, six, five, six. I might even consider a pair hand. Five, six pair hand which would be the third hand down under consecutive or under the uh, uh, singles and pairs category. But that's going to require a pair, a pair of flowers. So it's going to be risky. So at this point, we are being prompted to continue the Charleston or not. So let me just show you this potential pair hand here. Five, six, five, six, five, six. We have no flowers though. I'm going to stop here for a second and catch up with chat. So Carol says play 5-6 closed. Let's see. Uh, oh, hi, Kimmy. I don't think I've ever seen you in, in chat before. Thank you for writing in chat. Uh, let's see. Flowers. Yikes, flowers. Yes, we have no flowers. Okay, so here's, here's a point in time where you have to consider if you're gonna con continue the Charleston. We're in between three different hands and two of the three have gaps. We could play five, six, or let's see, we could play four, five, six, seven, cracks and bams. We have a gap of no four crack. Or we could play the pair hand, five, six, five, six, five, six. We have no gaps with the numbers, but we have a gap with no flowers. The other option would be to play five, six concealed with a pair of seven bands. Five, six, five, six, seven. There are no gaps and we have our pair secured. So what would you do? Would you play the concealed consecutive hand? Would you play the third hand down with a gap but that can use any number of jokers? Or would you push the pair hand? Those are the three choices. So write in chat one, two, or three. One would be the third hand down under consecutive run. Two would be the concealed hand. And three would be the, the pair hand. Type one, two, or three of which one you would do. Okay, so Dan says he would play the concealed hand. Okay, Cindy says she would play the concealed hand. Janet, concealed hand. Concealed hand is the winner, concealed, Pamela says. Probably the third hand under consecutive, Morty said. Third hand down says Vicky. Concealed hand says uh, Evelyn. Okay, Carol says skip the one with no flowers. That would be the pair hand. Okay, Mary, Mary Ann says number two, Kimmy says number two. Okay, so I, I agree actually, I would not play a pair hand here because of the gap, but I would leverage the multiples. And to take that further, you want to leverage the most of your multiples. The most of our multiples would be five, six, and seven. And therefore that would point to the concealed hand. So. I would probably push for the concealed hand. We have no gaps. If you're in between and you're at a decision point, go with the hand with no gaps. If you're between categories, pick the category for the strength of your hand where you have no gaps. So the third hand down, even though you can use any number of jokers, there's a gap. So that lowers the priority for that option. The pair hand, big gap with a pair of flowers. So that is very risky to push a pair hand. Even though we have no gaps with the numbers, we have a gap with the flowers. All right, so let's see. 
let's go ahead and continue. Let's go ahead and do uh, what could we what could we keep here? Let's go ahead and continue the Charleston, and we're going to pass very risky. We're going to pass two three six because we may still be able to play a pair hand. Let's just see if anybody gives us a, a flower. No flowers. And now we're going to go ahead and continue the Charleston. We have tiles we can pass. We're going to keep the potential pair tiles. The five, six in BAMs, basically. The five BAM in particular. Okay, so we have two, four, nine. These are not keepers, so we're going to keep it going. I don't think bots pass flowers. I wonder if they would. No flowers and no keepers. But you know what we did get? Check this out. Here's our five, six. We have five, six in pairs, five, six in bams, and here's a seven dot now. So at this point, we have an option for our pair of sevens. We can do five, six in cracks, five, six in bams, and then our pair of sevens. Or we could do five, six crack, five, six dot with a pair of seven bams. So at this point, I would say I want two and pass the one and the two and keep the seven because we have an option. We got a six. So there's another interesting variable. Now we have a pung. I would leverage that. So at this point, I would let the five, six in dots go and I would hold the seven bam as joker bait. So we have five, six, five, six, seven. Now this is gonna be a little risky because if we don't get that seven dot, we need that for a pair. So we're taking a risk by going with this combination. Either way, we don't need the two, so we can discard that. Two bamboos. We can go, let's go ahead and play this one out. Hmm. Oh, they punged already. Four bamboos. Let's see if we can get the seven dot early on. If we can get the seven dot, I would definitely go with this set of tiles in this arrangement with these suits. Cracks, bams, dots for the pair. But we're in between. So if we build up the seven dot, I would go with this plan. If we build up the six, five, six, I would abandon the seven dot and go with this multiple because we have our pair secured. So now we have a multiple where we were weak with the five, six in dots and we have a secure pair. Even though we have a pung, we now have our, our five, six in dots building up and our pair is secured. We can use any number of jokers everywhere else in the hand. So at this point, I would probably discard the five ban because we could always use jokers if we get that seven or really the six ban might have even been a better discard because then we could have used a joker for the six and kept the five because now we have a gap with no five ban. So let's see what happens. Three done. Oh, nobody's, uh, we didn't, the bots won't stop the Charleston. Nine dots. As far as I know. I don't think the bot stops Nine the Charleston. Days. Maybe, I could be wrong though. Okay, we got another six. At this point, I would even consider like numbers with sixes or maybe even a quint. Seven dots. This is why you don't want to pick a hand. Because you would be so focused maybe on this concealed hand, we could play that quint second hand down. We have five, six in cracks, and we have pungs of sixes in the other two suits. Let's just see what happens. We might be able to play a quint with the sixes. We hit some technical difficulties with this live stream, and I was not able to reconnect to YouTube. I tried to record the rest of this game so you could see how it ends. And for some reason, the video footage was lost. It ended in a wall game, so you didn't miss much. 
I ended up playing the concealed consecutive hand and needed jokers. Two of the robots had them in their hand, so the hand that I was playing was blocked. If you like this format, please let me know in the comment section below and we'll do it on a recurring basis. For now, I'm thinking the second Monday of each month. Thank you so much for coming to the live stream. And if you've watched the repost, thanks for watching. I want to say thank you to moderators who helped manage chat. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, consider subscribing. Click the little gray bell if you do. That way you'll get notification for when I post new videos and you won't miss an opportunity to learn a new strategy or pick up an insight to the game that could give you an advantage at the table. Between now and the next video, may all your picks be keepers.